contribute a lot of, hour, a lot of hours towards vetting these candidates, uh, initially finding them in the candidate list, and helping to characterize them. So I'll try my best to show you how amazing the collaborative effort has the results have turned into. <coughs> Excuse me. So as a brief overview, I'm going to talk about the TCE to KOI process that's going from the transit candidate in the light curve. Maybe it's just internal noise, maybe it's uh, uh, something that's not even a transit, and how that turns into a KOI to give you an aspect of the humans and their impact on making a KOI list, and maybe help Jesse be able to understand the process and I don't know, maybe replace us with computers or something. <laughs> So I'll give you an overview of the new planet population that you probably already been hearing a lot. Uh, Natalie was describing that this morning. Show you some of our new habitable zone candidates and then briefly talk about the next steps and where everything's happening. So the TCE, the KOI process. <laughs> I'll try to get that one for my car. <laughs> so we saw some slides earlier that talked about what the raw numbers were. They're actually a little bit deflated. There were 14,920 candidates that came out of the quarter one through quarter 12 pipeline run that turned into the 800 or so uh, KOIs that we're talking about now. Of these 14,920, they were all searched by humans to quickly pick out good candidates. And so a lot of people in the audience here were involved in that process. And the idea was to spend minimal time selecting candidates and to not be shy about passing something forward for more analysis. It's sort of like you take your 10 seconds, look at it, and it says, that's just noise, move on. Take 10 seconds, hmm, that might be a candidate, but I'm not gonna spend any time with it now, so I'm gonna put it in a to-do box and look at it next week with a larger committee and so forth. So, to give you an idea of how that broke down, is from that 14, 15,000, the, the, the humans passed 3,511 3, TCs, what we call triage. And then, a uh, small subset of the uh, Kepler SO sat down and analyzed these 3,500 and broke them down into essentially three categories. And you can see how well the humans did, with 62% had a real transit like its feature that we pulled out of it from extra analysis of light curves. Of that, 20% was ruled to just be stellar variability, most of the time just the star spot modulation and so forth. And another 19%, 20% was very low single to noise events that don't reach a specific threshold, essentially single to noise of seven. So it was, was thrown aside. From the 62% that came out, you can break that into two further categories. So 45% of the 3,500 turned into the KOIs uh, that then went for false positive for classification. And of course, there was a bunch of duplicates, about 17%, which consisted mostly of occultations to eclipsing binaries. So I can give you the slide with all the numbers and break down and go through a few of them quickly. First of all, the largest KOI that we have is number-wise, so if you want your stat, 4,914. It says we have identified close to 5,000 objects in the Kepler data set as EVs and planet candidates and so forth. Uh, that means we have some, another 2,000 new KOIs that include the multi-planets. Uh, for reference, quarter one through quarter eight went up to 3,149. So for the multi-occurrence rates, we're talking large numbers now. There are 866 systems that have at least two planet candidates in it, and you can see how the breakdown goes down. And now, as you've seen in the news recently, we even have one planet, one candidate with seven planets, which is KOI 351. Very exciting system. Um, from the 3,511 candidates observed, about half of them, let's see, we've had these new KOIs, it includes the new multis, of those, there's about over 300 that are obvious EBs, but we're now throwing a lot of eclipsing binaries into the KOI catalog, so we don't have to see them over and over again in the future and keep classifying them as EBs. The KOI list is sort of our scratch sheet for doing this work, so let's put the EBs on there too, so we don't have to work on them again in the future. What I think is exciting, there's 164 KOIs with periods greater than 200 days. I expect about half of those to be false alarms, and that's what turned out when we did the analysis uh, due to various artifacts. And I would recommend a few talks that you go see later on to get some in-depth about the process and how that works. And one of the unknown facts is there's actually 500 candidates that came from the quarter one through quarter 10 process that got tossed into this list as well. So it's a continuously non-homogeneous list of KOIs that we're always working on to make these catalogs. So now for the plots to show you what the populations look like. 
This was from January 7, 2013, with 2,740 candidates. Now, as of today, or actually, well, when the slide was put together, we now have 3,536 candidates shown by the yellow dots. And I think there's two trends I want to point out. One is that all the yellow dots are down towards smaller radii. The Kepler pipeline and his team were getting a lot better at identifying Earth-sized planets. That's really the general trend of the game here. Uh, and the other one to note is that if you go up to longer periods, say about 100 days or so, and look just about the, the smallest range, so around that two Earth radius range, you'll also notice that there is just as many yellow dots as there are red dots. We're also getting really good at picking out the long period, which makes total sense. Small candidates for, better, for lower signals and oil, longer periods with fewer trends, it's also harder to deal with signal noise. So the increase here is not just due to having an extra year of data. This is also due to us being a lot better at treating the data, removing artifacts from it, and also sorting through the TCE list and identifying the best candidates to move forward. In terms of breakdown in sizes, in the past, the point I want to point out here is in the past we had 351 Earth-sized planets, well, Earth size, I mean 1.25 Earth, uh, Earth radius and smaller, and now jumps up to 647. So it's a 78% increase in the number of Earth-sized planets. And as you can see, with the larger planets, there's not much of an increase as well. Because finding Jupiter-sized planets is fairly easy. You can see them by eye. Um, so we expect small yields there, and this is, and this is what. <clears throat> and the fact that we're seeing this is very really positive. In terms of habitable zone, there's a total of 104 planets of various sizes, up to, I think it's 25 Earth radii, that, have, that are in the habitable zone, which goes from about 183 to 300 and something Kelvin. So that's sort of wide range. Of those, there's 24 yellow dots on here that are new ones. And then of the yellow ones, 10 of those are smaller than two Earth radii, and a grand total of 24 to the cumulative KOI catalog have a radius less than two Earth radii. So it's amazing stuff. Um, you look at this a year ago, or two years ago, we were start digging into the data, and we were scratching hard just to get anything in the Hubble zone. And now we're just being flooded with dots across this entire diagram. Extremely exciting. So I'll highlight two systems for you. There's KOI 1422 that we've seen in the past. Uh, this one in the past has had two candidates, and so now it's run up to five. The plot on the right shows you the relative sizes. This is an M star. It's about 40% in radius compared to the sun. It's got five transiting planets around it with periods that range from nine days all the way up to 60 days and radius that go from about 70% the size of the Earth up to about 1.5 times the radius of the Earth. So there's two or three here that are likely in the Hubble zone of their, of their host star. And there was a paper out last night by Andrew Mann that talked about this one, so I'm glad I caught it before we talked about this today. But <laughs> the properties that I use for this look to be green, green well. And the bottom part here just shows you the solar system for scale. And that's not dust in there, that's, that's Earth transiting from the sun. And of course, the trend with Kepler is always finding planets around bigger stars and longer periods and smaller and so forth. So I can present to you KOI 4036. Maybe that will be the license plate. It's a K star with a potentially Hubble's own planet. The planet is nominal radius 1.8 times the radius of the Earth. It's in an orbital period about 170 days and receives the same amount of flux that the Earth receives at their respective distances. So the trend for Kepler is continuing. More data, better analysis, smaller planets, longer periods. All marching in the right direction towards finding the Earth-Sun analog. So I'm going to give you my summary. Keep this short and sweet for lots of questions. We have 847 new candidates that are coming out the quarter one through quarter 12 uh, catalog. I am now in the process of writing that up and I'll push it out as fast as I can. Uh, what I'm just truly amazed by is the 76% increase in Earth-sized planets. But as part of the false positive work, I wanted to point out Jeff Hoffman's work on period collisions. If you are dealing with false positives and looking at the data set and you're producing your own catalogs, you need to pay attention to Jeff's talk. This is sort of a new brand of false positives he's identified from the catalog. We have more than two dozen Hubble Zone candidates, including 10 new ones that are hurt size and potentially rocky. If you want to learn more about the best Hubble Zone candidates that we have, see Doug, Wells, Doug Caldwell's talk. It's the last one today, so you can't leave early and you get all the highlights on that. And then also see a late Lisa Quintana's talk, uh, poster, sorry, on a really cool Havel's own candidate. I won't say anything about it. I'll force you to go find her poster to see more about it. And other than that, I'll take questions.